Δεν κατάλαβα τελικά τι άλλαξε το Για το απόρριτο δυστυχώς περάσαν τα πάντα. Γεια σας. Τι άλλαξε τίποτε, παρακολουθεί. Πώς το απολογίζεσαι. Έγινε δεχτή η απόλυτη αναπομπή. Παρακολουθούν τους δικαιώρους κανονικά τώρα. Πιστεύω. Παρακολουθούν τους δικαιώρους. Και τι δικαιούνται να παρακολουθούν. Και τι δικαιούνται. Τα μεγάλη Σύμφωνα δεν είναι επίθεση. Αλλά θα πρέπει να κρίνεται. Ο δεν μόνο ένα πράγμα. Έχει επίθεση. Τι θα πρέπει να κρίνεται. Η ευλογή είναι η υποψία. Η νομολογία λέει. Ξέρει, καθορίζει τι σημαίνει. Να μην είναι παράλογη η υποψία. Τίποτε δεν πέρα αυτό. Είναι τραγικό. Είναι τραγικό. Μετά μπορεί να γίνει. Ο νόμος, ο νόμος αυτός έχει, έχει ένα λάθος. Ένα, ένα τεράστιο λάθος. Θεωρεί τον ίσο πρόεδρο Έχει και άλλα θέματα. Ξεκινά από το εσφαλμένο αυτό. Το... Ε, αν είναι μάστερας δεν είναι whistle blower. Έλα κόρη, έλα κόρη. Τώρα το αρχιάζω και τα ώρα. Καλησπέρα σας. Αν μπορείτε να καθίσετε για να ξεκινήσουμε. Κυρίε και κύριοι, καλησπέρα σα. Σα καλωσορίζουμε στη σημερινή μα εκδήλωση. Ε, πριν να ξεκινήσουμε, να σα αναφέρουμε ότι στι θέσει σα υπάρχει ένα ερωτηματολόγιο. Ε, γίνεται μια έρευνα από την Ακαδημαϊκό Δόκτωρ Μαρία Κραμβιά Καπαρδί αναφορικά με το θέμα που συζητάμε σήμερα, την προστασία των whistleblowers. Ε, και αν μπορείτε έτσι να πάρετε λίγο χρόνο να το συμπληρώσετε, είναι ανώνυμο και παρακαλούμε όταν συμπληρωθεί να τοποθετηθεί στο κουτί στο πίσω μέρο τη αίθουσα. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our today event. I would like to call to the podium the chair of the CIF board, Mario Scandalis, for his welcoming address.
Honorable Commissioner for Personal Data Protection, Mr. Efsati, on behalf of the President of the House of Representatives, Representative of the Ministry of Justice and Public Order, and Representative of the Police Force of Cyprus, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I welcome you to our today's event organized by the Cyprus Integrity Forum in collaboration with the Australian non-governmental organization Blueprint for, S for Free Speech. Today, along with our esteemed panelists, we are going to discuss measures on how new legislation on whistleblowing can be implemented and how existing technology can help in this area. Whistleblowing is one of the most effective ways of exposing malfeasance within an organization. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, around 40% of all detected occupational fraud cases are identified by whistleblowers. However, historically, whistleblowers have been denied the protection required to allow them to report wrongdoing, often leaving them exposed to retaliation. According to the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, the ECI, retaliation against U.S. workers who report suspected unlawful activity within their companies is occurring in ever greater numbers. <coughs> The ACI suggests that the rate of retaliation doubled between the period 2013 and 2018. Today, at least 46 countries do experience that, including about 20 countries in the European Union zone and around 10 each in Africa and Asia Pacific. On paper, we have come a very long way in the past 20 years. Standards developed by the United Nations, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Organization of American States, <coughs> and non-government organizations have assisted with the development and the enactment of new laws with up-to-date provisions. Anonymity is the cornerstone of any form of protection to whistleblowers. The introduction of whistleblower programs like the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commissions in which whistleblowers are allowed to report anonymously to the government regulator and their identify is not their identity is not revealed when a whistleblower award is made, will encourage more whistleblowers to come forward, explains Mary Inman, a partner at the Constantine Canon. Previously, concerns about their identity being revealed publicly have been an impediment to whistleblowers speaking to government prosecutors and regulators. However, the challenge today is making these laws practically effective, which has proved a rather onerous task. Even relatively modern legislation, such as Australia's federal public sector whistleblower legislation, which has passed in 2013, also bears a few weaknesses. In December 2018, the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill for Enhancing Whistleblower Protections 2018 was, en was enacted which is expected to create a single consolidated regime under the Corporations Act of 2001, extending protections to whistleblowers across the corporate, financial, and credit sectors. Globally, however, it is clear that more must be done to shield whistleblowers from reprisal. As such, efforts are underway across various jurisdictions to improve whistleblower protections, both legislatively as well as within organizations. Encouraging employees to report wrongdoings, to blow the whistle by providing them flexible means in doing so and effectively protecting them when they do, is essential for combating corruption in both the public and private sectors. Employees are usually the first to recognize wrongdoing in the workplace. Empowering them to speak up without fear of reprisal can help authorities both detect, but even more important, to deter violations. In the public sector, protecting whistleblowers can make it easier to detect passive bribery, the misuse of public funds, waste, fraud, and other forms of corruption. In the private sector, it helps authorities identify cases of active bribery and other corrupt acts committed by companies, and also helps businesses prevent and detect bribery in commercial transactions. Whistleblower protection is essential 
to safeguard the public interest and to promote a culture of public accountability and integrity. As it is stated by the Council of Europe, whistleblowers have a unique role to play in local and regional governance. At the subnational level, the one closest to the citizens, it's easier to detect alleged violations of law than at the national level. This also means that local and regional authorities are especially vulnerable to various types of corruption given their responsibility for public service provision, which is increasingly based on public-private partnerships accompanied by the transfer of public resources to the private sector. Concluding, the Cyprus Parliament needs to pass the legislation for whistleblowers the soonest possible, since they, have play, they play a key role in preventing breaches of law and protecting the society. Potential whistleblowers are often discouraged from reporting their concerns or suspicions for fear of retaliation, as today they stand totally exposed in Cyprus. We should protect whistleblowers from being punished, sacked, demoted, or sued in court for doing the right thing for society. This will help tackle fraud, corruption, tax evasion, and damage to people's health and the environment. Before giving the floor to Dr. Solet and Dreyfus, I would like to thank the Cyprus Chamber of Commerce and Industry for their support and the media sponsors, Vulido TV, as well as Antenna, for offering the live streaming of this event. I hope you all enjoy our today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skandalis. I would like to call to the podium Dr. Solette Dreyfus, Executive Director of Blueprint for Free Speech, for her welcoming address. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, uh, and thank you, Marios, uh, and uh, the Cyprus Integrity Forum for having us uh, here to share this event with you, uh, esteemed guests and panelists. I've been researching whistleblowing and whistleblowing protection for more than a decade, both in my academic life uh, and more recently in my life running Blueprint for Free Speech. I've interviewed a number of whistleblowers who have suffered really quite incredible personal hardship for what they have done. Uh, I think one uh, whistleblower summed it up correctly when he said to me, I lost my job, I lost my house, I lost my spouse. Uh, and this is because, as he said, many whistleblowers don't tell their family members until quite late in the process uh, what they've done in blowing the whistle, and then all of a sudden they find that their life is collapsing around them uh, and uh, their spouse is taken quite by surprise, uh, as maybe their children, um, if they suffer retaliation, for example, in their schools uh, or in other ways when the whistleblower's identity becomes public. Um, the individual is often disempowered by corruption. And I think one of the things that has drawn me to research work and support work for whistleblowers is that protecting whistleblowers helps engage individuals in the fight against corruption. It gives people who have a sense of, why would I try? Why would I bother? I can't change the system. A renewed sense of being able to actually do some small thing to turn that around. Some sense of needing a little bit of justice that they might not have thought that they could ever win simply by telling the truth. One reason that a freedom of speech organization is concerned with whistleblowing is because it's an interesting nexus between anti-corruption and free speech. I like to think of whistleblowing as the right to dissent from illegality and serious wrongdoing, to speak up about it. The EU uh, directive that was passed in April this year uh, is something that I hope will provide really excellent um, support for whistleblowers compared to what has become before. It's not perfect. There are things that I think many in civil society would like to see improved about it. And there's an opportunity for the EU member states who must adopt the EU directive into their own national laws in a process of national transposition to do a little bit better if they want to, to be a little bit more ambitious. And I hope that Cyprus, when it is deciding uh, how it will implement it, will think about these things 
uh, because whistleblowers are, in my view, the thing that can right a lilting ship when corruption strikes. Academic research that I've been involved with uh, across a number of countries, including notably other island countries, in this case the UK, Australia and Iceland, showed quite significant support for whistleblowers. In all of these countries, in general population surveys, 80% or more of the general population surveyed uh, said that they believed whistleblowers should be supported, not punished, even if they were revealing information from inside an organization. That's a number that uh, I think gets people involved in politics very excited. You know, public polling that is 60% is something that uh, makes uh, ministers' offices and their advisors raise their eyebrows, and 80% is something more uh, still. So, uh, in closing, I'd like to say that whistleblowing is something that is defined very broadly in the directive and with good reason. We were involved in a campaign with other civil society for a number of years before it was actually passed and this is one of the most winning features of the directive. Once narrowly defined as only being about financial corruption and narrow circumstances, the directive broadens this. And we've seen that borne out by cases elsewhere. For example, in the UK, possibly the best known whistleblowing has been in the health and aged care sector, where people have revealed the abuse of elderly and frail people in aged care homes, uh, the understaffing of doctors and under-resourcing in hospitals that has led to deaths. That didn't really have anything to do about a financial crime, but it was something of a behavior that was at odds with public mores, and people were outraged about it. There are other examples, and the most recent of these is only a few weeks old, and has actually struck Australia, the coronavirus. So this virus that I think we unfortunately will see more of uh, has already erupted in cases in Australia. Australia, like a number of other countries, including a number of European countries, has closed its borders to China, except for its own citizens, permanent residents, or their families. We know something about this virus because early on in the piece, a doctor in Wuhan blew the whistle about what was going on. He didn't <laughs> blow the whistle to everyone. He spoke in an environment that was a group chat to his fellow doctors, alumni of his medical school, that what he had seen was something akin to the SARS virus, but he was seeing a number of patients of it. And the authorities came to him and said, you must retract this. You must take it back. You are disrupting public order. A number of other whistleblowers in the health sector stepped forward in the intervening time, nurses and others, who told the truth about how bad this virus was and how significant the epidemic had become. Unfortunately, that first whistleblower doctor died from the coronavirus just recently. So really, sometimes whistleblowers pay terrible prices. Um, nonetheless, he has done us a great favor. And it's interesting to note that the highest court in China made particular mention of the fact that these whistleblowers should not have been penalized uh, for the telling of the truth in the public interest of public health. So I look forward to the panel discussion tonight. Um, Whistleblowing as a research area has never been dull. It's got many facets, uh, technological, social, policy, law, all sorts of things, and I hope that our panel tonight will explore some of these. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andreifus. And now I would like to call to the podium Mrs. Elpida Soronos for her statement on behalf of the Minister of Justice, of Justice and Public Order. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Please allow me at the outset to express my appreciation and to the core organizers and hosts of this event. Corruption is an enemy to health, to education, to sports, to development, to equal opportunities, to security. Corruption is an enemy to and undermines justice, democracy, and the rule of law. It exists to serve the interest of the few, of the corrupted ones, 
and sabotages the interests and prosperity of the many, of society, of the poor, of the less privileged, of the ordinary citizens. It erodes the quality and efficiency of government and destroys public trust in it and its officials and institutions, and of course, in political leaders. Corruption is almost always related to the biggest, most aggressive problems of humanity and facilitates the existence and preservance of horrible, horrible crimes and not just financial ones. Yet corruption exists, and it is a phenomenon that affects all countries with recent researches showing astonishing numbers in figures as the financial and economic costs of corruption. For example, it is estimated that one trillion US dollars is paid in bribes each year worldwide. This money is money that is not going to the society, to populations, and all the areas we mentioned above for which corruption is an enemy. Education, health, development, opportunities. No state is immune to it, regardless of its level of economic or social development. It is only when the detrimental effect of corruption is understood that action is truly undertaken. Political will is essential for the success of anti-corruption action. The fight against corruption lies within the top priorities of the government of the Republic of Cyprus. The Ministry of Justice and Public Order took the initiative in 2015 to draft the first national strategy against corruption, which was later on approved by the Council of Ministers on June 28, 2017. Furthermore, a five-year national horizontal action plan against corruption implementing the national strategy has been prepared by the Ministry, which was approved by the Council of Ministers on May 15 last year. The national action plan aims at improving the political, social and legislative environment through coordinated actions in six key pillars, prevention, education, raising awareness and changing society's attitude and perceptions, modernization of legislation, suppression, monitoring. Since, anti since corruption presents a challenge both to public as well as private sectors, the national strategy covers both sectors. In order to bring all the actors involved on the same page regarding basic knowledge and understanding on the concepts related to corruption, the ministry started full force in educating and raising awareness on the topic. The Anti-Corruption Awareness Day on the 11th of June of last year for all focal points on public and private sectors marked the beginning of the first training cycle of public officials for the prevention of corruption. The training days focused on a wide range of crucial and hot topics such as corruption and public administration, ethics and integrity, public procurement, internal audit. In the words of Transparency International, corruption often goes unchallenged when people do not speak out about it. Whistleblowing is one of the most direct methods of shining the light on corruption. Since whistleblowers, as Mr. Scandali said before, often have access to information which sometimes cannot be detected by other integrity mechanisms and institutions. However, whistleblowers need and deserve protection from retaliation when reporting. The ministry has already in 2016 prepared a bill addressing the issue. The bill provides supplementary provisions on the protection of persons reporting acts of corruption, both in the public and the private sectors. Whistleblowers, persons not involved in the acts, that is. And of course, this is further to the protection already provided for in the protection of witnesses, that is Law 95 of 2001. Also, the bill provides for other measures of leniency for those who are involved in the acts of corruption, but voluntarily report to the police and offer cooperation with the authorities resulting in the full investigation and prosecution of the case. This concerns the maximum penalty on conviction for them to be half of that provided for in the offense in question. The bill is still pending before the Committee of Legal Affairs of the House of Representatives, though its discussion has been gone forward last year. On the 23rd of October 2019, the EU Directive 1937 of 2019 on the protection of persons who report breaches of union law, known as the Whistleblowing Directive, was adopted. The new measure will guarantee a high level of protection for whistleblowers who report breaches of EU law by setting EU-wide standards. 
It will establish safe channels for reporting both within an organization and to the public authorities. The ministry is already planning its transposition into domestic law, where, of course, all the issues, including the internal and external reporting mechanisms, will be regulated accordingly. The fight against corruption is not the business or the responsibility of one, but of everyone. It is only through good, true relationships that real change can be achieved in this fight, be it relationships with local counterparts in public and private sector, civil society, NGOs, academia, be it rela international relations with other state departments, our EU partners, and international organizations, literally everyone. In, in this fight, like in many others, we cannot afford the, to exclude anyone who honestly and truly and seriously wants to contribute to the fight of these cancerous issues called corruption. We do believe in a concerted collaborative effort that reaches across every sector. The first step and perhaps one of the most important preconditions of any attempt in this fight is the genuine and honest political leadership and commitment to bring the anti-corruption process further. In closing, I wish to reiterate and stress that fighting corruption is a priority for the Ministry of Justice and Public Order and the Cyprus government. And this fight is evidenced by actions and not just words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Solonos. Now let's proceed with the panel discussion. Dr. Solet Dreyfus, the floor is yours. See if I can work. <laughs> there we go. I hope. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, now, uh, please excuse my poor pronunciation of uh, Cypriot last names. I have rehearsed, but uh, I clearly um, am not going to be perfect at this. Um, so I would uh, suggest that we uh, receive the first uh, discussion um, from the representative of the uh, Cyprus Integrity Forum Board, Stelios Hadristophilis, and I apologize if I've mutilated that, but I've tried, uh, to see if you might like to answer the question uh, in introductory broad terms. Could you give us a brief opening comment on why you think whistleblower protection is important in the Cyprus context? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Look, I represent the Cyprus Integrity Forum. In fact, I represent, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I represent the medical part. I'm personally a kind of a whistleblower where I try to report something regarding medicine. But uh, it's not only the problem to protect the whistleblowers. That one I wouldn't really care at the moment, but the problem is that there is no place where you can report it and wait something to happen. So what's happened to the whistleblower is one thing, but what's happening to improve things is another thing. So if we are going to, to put such legislation in Cyprus to, to improve whistleblowing should be practical and efficiently implemented. We don't have to get the legislation just because other countries have it. We have to get things that we could wait, we, we could expect a result out of it. So we can start with simple things, if that is SMEs or whatever, but we have to be open this thing to expand. And as we have quite a few experts on the subject here, uh, I would like to know for argument's sake, in Australia, as far as I know, the whistleblowing doesn't implement in uh, in national security issues, immigration, and so on. Uh, what is national security is everybody to define it. So we don't know what's happening with that thing. We know that the Americas now they can pay whistleblowers, that they whistleblowing, and by pay them, they, they've got benefits in certain uh, countries, for argument's sake, Greece and Siemens. So if uh, somebody is whistleblowing in one country, paid by another country, 
what, what is happening, what, what are the issues regarding these things. So yes, we believe strongly that uh, we have to protect the whistleblowers. It has to be practical, and for that to be practical, we need a lot of people involved, including the police, parliament, and so on. And I believe strongly we don't need another legislation just to show off. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Let's see if this is on. Uh, I would invite as Associate Professor Maria Grambia Capardi. Uh, have I done that right? Oh, good. I tried that one all afternoon. Uh, from the Cyprus University of Technology. Um, perhaps you could tell us, because of your academic expertise, among other things, um, the EU directive protecting whistleblowers is, of course, the first of its type in the world to be applied to so many countries in one go. Can you give us a summary of what you think are the most important elements of the EU directive for Cyprus? Okay, I think... Okay. Well, I think the uh, European Union um, has um, finally managed to uh, come through with a very um, comprehensive directive, because it's not only looking at the it's not only looking at the legislative firm framework, but it's looking at a holistic approach. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, the, uh, I have uh, pointed about five issues that I'd like to address. The first of all is that the directive is looking at uh, to cover the public sector, the private sector, that's entities with more than 50 employees, and municipalities with more than 10,000 um, uh, residents. Now, um, it, it's also asking the, the government to appoint, uh, to develop a platform where not only it's going to set up a legislative framework, but it has to have the necessary body that will be receiving uh, these complaints or these allegations. Uh, and these allegations have to be um, investigated within three month period. Now, um, it also, interestingly enough, it doesn't only cover employees, it covers ex-employees, um, it covers trainees, volunteers, contractors, subcontractors, so it's quite wide, uh, which is also a very good issue. Another interesting issue is that it, it doesn't only cover corruption. It covers health and safety issues. It covers issues of transport. And many of you would remember we've had the Ilios um, airplane crash in Cyprus. We had the Marie explosion. So we had a number of incidents that indicate why whistleblowing should not be only concentrating on corruption, but should cover health and safety matters. Now, another issue is that the government should develop, um, uh, uh, identify that uh, and protect uh, whistleblowers against retaliation and provide remedial measures against retaliation. And interestingly enough, the government should provide financial, legal, and psychological assistance to those people and provide legal, uh, economic, and psychological assistance. When Transparency International Cyprus carried out, uh, which is now uh, Cyprus Integrity Forum, carried out as um, a conference in 2015, um, and we had a number of whistleblowers speaking. They said that they suffered huge psychological um, uh, issues and repercussions. Many of them were antidepressants. So it, uh, it's, it's good that th that issue is also covered. Uh, but I'm very hopeful that the, that the relevant ministry will go ahead and set up uh, the relevant um, framework um, and the relevant platform in order to address these issues. A number of whistleblowers in the past have said um, that it is not enough just to blow the whistle. What are you doing with that information? So if it's a, an issue of uh, health and safety um, and you're calling about some containers that are about to blow up, is someone going to get in the car and go and make sure that those containers are going to be moved so we can have these people still alive with us? So the, the, the issue is, the, is a lot deeper than that. We need to make sure we take action. Uh, so that's in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Uh, and I would now invite Mr. Costas 
and um, here we go, Estafio. Have I got that right? Yes. Estafio, good. Okay. Also been practicing that this afternoon. Uh, member of the Parliament of Cyprus and who is representing the President of the Cyprus Parliament this event. Um, all EU member states must translate the protections for whistleblowers set out in the directive to areas uh, uh, to international uh, transposition um, of the laws. And uh, this has to be translated into areas uh, beyond just um, applying to SMEs or particular companies. For example, what is your opinion regarding the need for protecting the identity of whistleblowers? Protecting the identity, I think, is uh, this is a crucial. Is if, if the only um, thing to um, to be stressed on that. The problem and uh, my, my my concern when uh, dealing with the bills before the legal affairs uh, committee in the parliament is that they do. They do treat the um, whistleblowers as um, a witness who are not. Because if, if uh, you treat the whistleblower as um, a witness, that means that there is no anonymity, and then that we have to, you have to deal with the leniency program, um, program or measures in order to persuade the whistleblower to go on. So the anonymity is uh, the hard core, if I may say, of the whole system. And um, this is my really concern, real concern when dealing with the two bills before the um, legal affairs. They, don't, they, they treat the whistleblower to be a, um, not to, to lift the anonymity veil of the whistleblower, which is very bad. And uh, if we insist on that model, then it's probably sure that we are going to fail again in Cyprus. So the main concern is not to treat the whistleblower as a witness. The whistleblower is the one who whistles, who gives the information, and then uh, we have to provide for an accounta accountability system of the authority who receives the information who receives the um, the whistle and do nothing and does nothing this is our main uh, concern point so accountability on behalf of the of the authorities who are entitled and the, who which they have to act on uh, on on a certain direction do not Lifting the veil, the anonymity veil of the uh, which protects the whistleblower, and um, if I may so, a third prerequisite is um, not to treat the whistleblower as Assange and Snowden had been treated by the authorities when they did whatever they did, and they reveal all this uh, information which, uh, for which they are hunted now. So these are the three main concerns. And if we do not um, resolve these uh, concerns, then it probably will be a waste of time in Cyprus. If I might ask uh, one additional question of you. One thing we found uh, uh, in this European um, Union supported project uh, is the interesting problem of language uh, regarding the word whistleblower. Um, and perhaps Bruno can speak about this in a few minutes, but um, the term whistleblower has been translated uh, perhaps badly mm -hmm. um, in a number of, of places. Uh, in um, Spain, the term is... Uh, Denunciante. Denunciator, uh, as opposed to alertador. Um, in French, uh, they have a wonderful uh, term for it, lanceur d'alert, early warning system. Um, what is the term in terms of translation into language here? And is it a term that you think accurately and correctly describes what whistleblowers do? 
informer, a informer who has a bad, um, is, is there, there is a bad background mm -hmm. of the word informer mm -hmm. that goes back to to Eoka struggle. There were informers, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. something which is uh, not coincides with the with um, the the real meaning of the whistle blowing. This is has, is nothing but. Mm -hmm. So we have to to give, to mm -hmm. find and give a, um, a very precise, mm -hmm. but not um, at the same time not um, unjust. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for for the time being, I I am not in a position to give this. Uh, it's a. But, it, but it's not a witness. Hmm? The problem is that this whistleblower is a not and must not be treated as a witness. If we treat them as a witness, we, lo we already lost hmm. the game. So it's a, just an interesting, uh, we'll go on to the other speakers and then definitely take questions. Um, but I think it's an interesting question because words matter. And the framing comes from the words. Uh, and if you want to define what a whistleblower is, you must choose the right words in your language. Um, I would now invite the Commissioner for Personal Data Protection in Cyprus, Ms. Irene mm, Louisidou. Yes, working on it. <laughs> Nicoli Du, no, Nicoli Thu. Good, okay. Uh, to, to perhaps uh, speak about. Um, how international standards call for the creation of anonymous channels for whistleblowers uh, to be able to make disclosures of serious wrongdoing or corruption. Um, and indeed, secure channels uh, are already required in some law in European countries, such as Italy, which passed whistleblower protection legislation in November 2017. Uh, and that was the technical uh, security element was a part of that law. Um, would you encourage Cypriot legislators to provide the option of anonymous channels for whistleblowing, and what do you see as the advantages or disadvantages? First of all, allow me to thank uh, the Cyprus Integrity Forum and especially Mr. Skandalis for the invitation to participate. And uh, allow me as well to, um, to say a few things about our involvement Involvement as DPAs into this issue. Um, our um, background goes back to 2006, uh, the date with the Article 29 Working Party issued the opinion one of 2000, 2006 on the application of EU data protection rules to internal whistleblowing schemes in the fields of accounting internal accounting controls, auditing matters, fight against bribery, banking, and financial crime. This opinion provided guidance on how internal whistleblowing schemes could be implemented in fully compliance with the EU data protection rules enshrined in directive back then 9546. The main point, in order to uh, realize the, the background, the main point of this opinion was that the data protection rules are applicable in every step of the procedure of the whistleblowing scheme, from the collection of the information procedure until the destruction. Whistleblower and accused person are equally protected non-disclosure of the identity of the whistleblower to the person accused unless when the accusation proved to be false and maliciously made. We, co we could elaborate on the provisions of the existing initiatives of Cyprus later on. And let me go back to the question. Of course, there are some drawbacks in um, um, uh, for the creation of anonymous channels for whistleblowers to be able to make disclosure of serious wrongdoing of corruption. Um, some of my concerns, of our concerns, and we have to take, first of all, we, we need to take into consideration the culture of each member state. We don't have the same culture everywhere, so 
I think it's the first thing we have to uh, take into consideration. Being anonymous does not stop others from successfully guessing who raised the concern, particularly in more countries like Cyprus. For us, the competent authorities and the supervisory authorities, it's is harder to investigate anonymous reports if uh, competent authorities cannot ask follow-up questions. It is easier to protect whistleblowers ag against retaliation when their identity is known to the competent authorities. Anonymous reports can lead people to focus on the whistleblower, maybe suspecting that he or she is, the, is raising the concern maliciously. There is a, a risk as well of developing a culture of receiving malevolent, frivolous, or inaccurate anonymous report. In the light of the above, I have my doubts if anonymous schemes would part, 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 practically sorry, work in a, in a small country like Cyprus. And of course, uh, it's not a matter of, uh, Marios uh, mentioned that, that we don't need just the protection. We need effective protection through safeguards, mechanisms, uh, and procedures. Since nowadays, whistleblowers are totally ex exposed. Thank you very much for that. Um, and now I would ask Mr. Bruno Galizzi, who is the uh, project coordinator of the EU supported Expanding Anonymous Tipping, otherwise known as EAT project, uh, uh, who works at FIBGAR. Um, you coordinate the EU funded project. Uh, and it's a highly innovative project, which obviously Blueprint is also involved with. Um, in fact, a world first implemented uh, across 11 countries in the EU by a partnership of eight not-for-profit organizations, including NGOs ranging from freedom of expression, anti-corruption, to media development and community education, uh, and covers uh, such countries as Malta, Italy, Spain, Bulgaria, Greece, and Romania, among others. Where um, have the uh, secure digital drop boxes already been employed to take whistleblower disclosures? For example, municipalities and agencies in Spain, which has been surprisingly very um, advanced in this relative to a number of other countries, despite having uh, no protections and legislation for whistleblowers. So this is where implementation has, in a rare uh, situation, um, accelerated in advance of law. Um, and uh, what are the case studies of it being done well versus badly? And then how does the EU project work? Okay, uh, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, it's a pleasure for, for us being here as um, project manager and representing FIBGAR. FIBGAR is a, a Spanish foundation uh, working for human rights uh, in Spain, but also Europe-wide. And we have offices in Argentina, in Colombia, and in Mexico, so we have also part of our work in Latin America. Uh, since five years now, we are working on the whistleblowing issue. Uh, we started working on it um, by developing a cultural, social, and legal framework around Europe to protect whistleblowers. And we got involved with the drafting, uh, revision, and advocacy campaigning for, for the EU directive, um, also partnering with Blueprint before. Um, we happily managed to have um, a very good directive out there. And, and we got involved with the implementation process. It is um, an European project to disseminate internal external disclosure channels, secure and anonymous disclosure channels based on a technology developed by an NGO um, in, in Italy who has been, uh, which has been used before in several private and public administrations. Um, and we are working, as Celeste mentioned, in different countries. We are working in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, 
Croatia, Bulgaria, Greece, Italy, Malta and Spain. So there are many countries involved. We are seven in local organizations working on the ground. Uh, working on the ground to promote these tools to, as a matter of fact, I mean, actually protect whistleblowers. The transposition process will be a process, and it could take more or less time. But we have now the opportunity to start to install some initiatives to actually protect those disclosure information, disclosure information in the public interest. Um, of course, as part of this project, we also gather a lot of information because there are a lot of um, legislation into place in those countries. In Spain, for example, we discovered that a lot of the data protection legislation has to do with the, or will have to do with the transposition process of the directive. As long as the, as well as the compliance officer legislation for the private sector. Um, we also have the public administration law who has something to do with the internal mechanism to report some information internally. So we brought to gather together a lot of information about the law. Um, and I would like to also to uh, highlight that um, Spain, Spain has um, a zero out of uh, 100 in a um, research we ran, uh, Blueprint ran in 2018, while Cyprus only has 3.7 out of 100 in that score. It's an evaluation of the existing mechanism to protect whistleblowers um, based on the analysis of uh, international standards. Which are our main problems uh, now to face and the examples based on these um, drop boxes? We have um, first in the transposition a problem with the um, um, trans translation. Um, as you said, um, we are having problems to separate the whistleblowing world and the panel processal world. So we have to differentiate between whistleblowers and denunci denunciators. We have been advocating for that uh, for now more or less four years, three years. And last week, um, no, two weeks ago, our Ministry of Justice um, gave a public speech based on the word alertador, which was a very big um, win of that process um, to properly try to separate uh, those things and to articulate them in a better way. Um, secondly, is there is a risk to narrow the scope to anti-corruption, only anti-corruption. Um, as we mentioned before, the directive bring us to think in a, in a wider scope um, and to include other kind of topics like uh, environmental things as health, um, transport, etc. Um, we also are, discuss are discussing a national authority and, and, and it's, it's great to have a national authority uh, to protect whistleblowers, and we advocate to do that um, as long as we don't confuse or not put a lot of focus on that. The director will have to provide um, an organizational change, um, um, an institutional wide change for all member states by developing those internal and external disclosure channels. Who will take care of those external disclosure channels, what would happen with unions, with political parties, mm -hmm. with the parliament itself. Um, those are ans uh, questions that we are have to answer so far. So, and, and, I, and I just go back to some examples, sorry for the length. Um, um, many, many of the, th we have some examples using this technology um, in Spain. The anti-fraud agency of Valencia, which is a very, very innovative, uh, innovative and, and yeah, changing, ground-changing um, organization, has developed um, a Dropbox based on the GlobalX technology, which is the same that Glo uh, that it project use. Um, the municipality of uh, Barcelona also has its Dropbox. 
as well as the municipality of Madrid, but the municipality of Madrid forces everyone reporting information to have an ident identification based on the digital signature that they use for the municipality. So, who, of course, that the numbers and the results that we appreciate from an, ex from an experience as the Valencia experience and the Madrid experience are very, very different. Um, but I, I just want to close this intervention saying that um, we highly appreciate in the EAT project that when the government doesn't provide an answer or doesn't provide the possibility to install and to use and to disclose information in a secure way, civil society has taken the, the initiative so far. And we have at least two drop boxes in Spain who has um, published and report big corruption scandals. Um, use it installed and managed by civil society. Xnet is one of the example, and Filtrala is the second one. So I I would like to also recognize the value and the courage of those organizations working on the ground, and and as project manager of the EAT project, we also would like to encourage um, to the development and the dissemination of these these experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. What I would propose to do is take some questions uh, from the audience uh, and then uh, perhaps get a closing statement uh, from Dr. Hadristofels, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions uh, from the floor? I think you raised your hand before just down the back. Uh, the gentleman, yes? No? Which means traitor. Traitor. <laughs> 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 You get the right word, the more central word, the more noble word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very good point. Uh, and I hope this will provoke a debate beyond this evening about what the right word here is in Cyprus for whistleblower. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, well, the, thank you for the question. I, I appreciate the opportunity to better explain how it, um, um, an instances work. Um, this is uh, a sort of channel <laughs> that provides a uh, high level of anonymity using the Tor bro browser. The tor, tor browser is a specific browser um, which delocalize your identification online so and it's free and it's free yeah um, and creates uh, two-way ch communication channels between the whistleblower and the other point of communication that is defined by ob obviously by the institution running the Dropbox so for example for a private institution could be a compliance officer or for or a human resources uh, responsible um, or for the, the, the public sector could be an anti-corruption officer 
or someone with some responsibility of malpractice. Um, the Dropbox provides the possibility not only to send messages in both directions, keeping the anonymity of the two parts of the communications, but also provides the possibility to send attached files in several um, kind of formats. Um, and I think that's more or less, mm -hmm. it, it's very, very simple to use and provides you with the possibility to go back to make the disclosure and to go back to the information by providing you a, a large number, which you are not supposed to keep anything anywhere else than a piece of paper to you. You don't, are not supposed to copy and to, to put it on your desk uh, on, the, on your PC, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Um, hmm? Else yeah. in the panel keen yeah. to answer that? I think the issue is not only the, only the anonymity. You know, we've been consulted in several occasions uh, aiming to support this fight against corruption in the public and private sector. And one of our common points was that any initiative uh, should have in place, should, ha should establish procedures, mechanisms, channels for a lawful submission, mm -hmm. a lawful submission, handling and monitoring of reported whistleblows, and of course for the protection of personal data. It's not only to establish a simple procedure. You need to safeguard everything in each step, in each stage of the reporting. Mm -hmm. the Femme, is something? I mean, let's imagine that there is a whistling. There is a whistle. There is, a, and nobody does anything. I mean, stay there. This is the reason I say that this is a very delicate uh, matter and issue because how can the whistleblower can react by by. Uh, the press by stating uh, saying his name or her name and they I made um, I gave the information and nothing moved this is not <laughs> this is not a protection so we have to find the the accountability system which is very crucial to the whole uh, system otherwise authority either public or private can filter and can decide whether they proceed or not with the information depending their um, interest or their, um, uh, I mean, their, let's say, um, their needs. So we need a accountability system which uh, can provide that the information given will be treated equally will be treated in a, in a way not to destroy the whole idea. It's, it's interesting, but one thing I've found in all my academic research uh, uh, when I've given evidence in front of the Australian Parliament, State Parliament in Victoria and, and elsewhere, uh, is that in having to respond to the fundamental questions about whistleblower protection, uh, a society must often ask itself questions about accountability and accountability structures that it had never addressed before. It forces a reckoning of those things, and that can be quite a positive thing for, for fighting corruption. Uh, I think Mario has just a small comment because uh, Mrs. Sapu and uh, Mrs. Yosu have touched the issue. The actual cause. <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Lloyd, you mentioned that actually I'm going to go a step back and, and uh, what my colleague stated uh, at this airport has mentioned that it's not the laws that we need. We're looking for an effective system, not the, the actual law. And uh, uh, Mrs. Lloyd, you have mentioned, in terms of we need to ensure a lawful submission. And that would extend the leg and say, and subsequent to that, an ethical handling. And I use very correctly the word, ethical handling. Because in Cyprus, we are used to, especially the old private organizations, to be just, uh, 
offering is a thief. But unfortunately, we do it for other reasons, not for the right ethical reasons that the whistleblowing function should represent. And uh, I would just like to give an example. A few years ago that uh, we received funding <coughs> for the observation of the, of the alert, the open line of communication of the public, so because the public needed some sort of uh, mechanism to ensure that the tips that they had for possible corruption could be the role of, the, of justice. And uh, even us at the board of CIF that we were handling that line, we were not supposed to even know any details of the complaints or the tips submitted to us. We just received coded messages and the recipient organization, meaning, meaning the Office of the Attorney General or the Office of the General of the just to make sure that the actual uh, person submitting the information was receiving fair treatment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, we need to be very, very careful, and I would like to thank them, Mrs. Zulini and uh, Mr. Stabil, as well as my members from the board, that they have touched that because I consider that to accord the access and system. Uh, there was a question over here in the front row. Hi, um, maybe in Cyprus there's a tendency, everyone's saying, okay, full transparency, uh, mm -hmm. come, uh, come up front, say everything, full transparency and everything. And I agree that this is not the right way to do things. But on the other hand, who has the burden of proving? Mm -hmm. Is it the assistant? Is it the whistleblower? So, mm -hmm. When a um, couple of years ago, I prepared a report for the then Minister of Justice, and I recommended an independent commission against corruption. And within that, there was there is to be um, a department that is to be collecting all this information from whistleblowers. Uh, that would be collecting all this information, and then ICAC, um, which will be set up like ICAC in Australia. Um, will be analyzing it, analyzing the information, and going further than that and saying, okay, we've had a number of complaints against uh, a, a particular department, that's when we're gonna investigate. So, um, uh, so they are not only looking at, so our um, ministry, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Elpida, that that's what it's looking at. So they are trying to develop the entire framework um, and within that, there is going to be that avenue of receiving the, uh, the complaints and so forth. So, yeah. I thought Bruno wanted to answer as well. Very short comment because um, we are dealing with the, with the same questions in, in Spain right now. Um, and and I and I had very I mean several c conversations with the director of the anti fraud agency in in Valencia, and and he pointed out that um, at the very end of this experience, um, what matters is the intention of the people running public institutions, and how you interpret the law, and what do you want to do with that legislation, so. I'm 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 just pointing it out because it's, it's, it is about cons the construction of, of a legal framework and, and a specific and, and a very clear procedure for all type of disclosure channels, internal, external, authorities, whatever it is. But it also is about to encourage those on in power of running that implementation to do it the best possible. No. 
you want to? Yeah, um, you have the uh, mic. Use it. Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Efik Santo. I'm representing the Cyprus Green Party. I'm very surprised that people are saying that we don't need legislation because I think that it's the first thing that we need if we want to protect the anonymity of people that are actually giving us information that they have no right to give us. I think we're forgetting that factor. We're not talking about, um, oh, this is real, this is the truth, it has to go out. We're talking about people that lose their jobs. We are talking about people that get sacked because they have given this information out. And it shouldn't be legal for somebody to be sacked because they did the right thing. So I, the question should be, how do I ensure that I get the information that I need, not by somebody that is male volunt, that it isn't treated publicly in a way that I'm basically destroying people's reputations without this scandal actually being true. So how do I create a framework that protects the person who wants to give me the information, mm -hmm. but at the same time, somebody is responsible for looking at it? For instance, we have been doing this for a very long time, and the reason that we have, as a political party have been forced to do this, where we have people that are giving us information, is because then it can be tracked back to that person. Mm -hmm. It could be anybody. That information is given over by the president of the party. It could be anybody. It could be somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody and then it just went up the chain. Mm -hmm. If the information is okay, the responsible authority where we will forward it, because that's the other issue. We don't just, there, there's not one responsible authority. It depends on what kind of information it is, what it has to be dealt with. It is, suscept it, it is responsible to respond to us as, as an organization. What we need in Cyprus is not to have a political party having to do this. I mean, we love doing it, but this is not the responsible way. We're supposed to have an authority that is responsible in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. Somebody, not just the Auditor General who's responsible for specific aspects of the government, and I want to stress this, it's only specific aspects. Mm -hmm. The Auditor General is not looking into what is being done by other independent authorities in the way that he should. Nobody is looking at the judicial, which is a huge problem of the whole factor, of the whole framework that we have as Cyprus and why things are not working. Nobody is looking at where the process went wrong in that aspect. And come on, let's remember, we were just talking only a few days ago about the deputy chief of police being sacked because he supposedly gave information, a fact that has not been proven, but this person has lost their job. Mm -hmm. We have people that have lost their jobs or have been... Um, had um, 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 a, a transfer like mm -hmm. from uh, one city to the other because it's, they have given information publicly. I mean, these are the things that we should be talking about. I, I am very surprised and I want to see a framework that protects these people and doesn't make them susceptible or dependent to finding the right person to give the information. I mean, I trust us, but what if they gave it to somebody that isn't a trustworthy person and then they get all this public shaming and losing their jobs and whatever other repercussions. Mm -hmm. Do we have? I might just put a statistic out there that's kind of interesting in the context of what is called third tier whistleblowing. So, first tier being internal, second tier being to a regulatory authority, and third tier being to an external. Um, the polling, the public polling I told you that we'd done uh, for research about support for whistleblowers also asked a question uh, across these three countries about what was the public attitudes to whether or not whistleblowers should be allowed to go to the media, either in the first instance as a last resort or in specific situations. 87% um, or more of the population of these countries all said that whistleblowers should be allowed to go to the media. That is a staggeringly high number for a gold standard population survey, 87%. So that's quite telling. I mean, going to an MP, going to a, another institution such as a labor union is, is are all alternatives to going to the media. Um, they're all what's termed third tier whistleblowing. But it was quite surprising to see how strong the public support was for that. I want, might take two more questions and then go to a uh, wrap up. Yes. body. It has been in the parliament since March uh, 2019. Uh, the debate has not yet uh, been uh, started and uh, one of the competences of this uh, independent anti-corruption body will be taking the complaints and treating them among many, many other things that the bill is providing. Good to have information. We have the 
gentleman down the back. There are two of us. Just I want to pick up the last few questions and then one here. Okay, yeah, uh, maybe a, a remark of um, technical nature than a general one. Uh, concerning the directive, maybe everybody does not know what the directive is. Directive is uh, the EU law. So it's not a question if we need or not a law. This was adopted. Mm -hmm. This was adopted the 7th of October 2019. Mm -hmm. And member states, all member states, mm -hmm. including, of course, Cyprus, have two years in order to implement this directive, mm -hmm. which means they will put all the legal means in place mm -hmm. so by the 7th of october 2021 mm -hmm. there will be the law in order to protect the whistleblowers and then there was a lot of uh, discussion about um, what is the term and this is correct because in our language in, in, in greek uh, it has um, a specific meaning uh, which is um, uh, for, for, for Greek people, it is uh, linked uh, to, to the past, it's linked to the dictatorship, it's linked to, to the, mm -hmm. also the German occupation uh, in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So the, the term used, and I know is Mr. Sathieu does not uh, like it, but this is what it, use, it is used in the directive, is witness of public interest. Mm -hmm. This is how whistleblower is, uh, is mm -hmm. interpreted. Uh, and the, 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 the general remark is about a comment made earlier about the judicial system. It is clear that a citizen, when uh, he or she knows uh, that um, justice might be done, might be done after six, seven, ten, or even 15 years, mm -hmm. this will deter the citizen of eventually mm -hmm. uh, 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 making this, uh, if you want, uh, information uh, known to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also clear when uh, somebody believes uh, that, um, well, I will not do that because uh, with uh, a phone call uh, to the minister or of the minister, maybe the whole thing uh, will be put uh, aside mm -hmm. and then I will probably have uh, some consequences for, for my job. So if this is the perception, and in some cases in for very good uh, reasons there is this uh, perception, it is clear that whatever law you put in place, uh, this will not uh, allow people to act. Mm -hmm. And if people do not act, people who know the information, I mean, then we do not have a result. P they must see also that there is an end and there is a result to of, of their action. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. cases, are, uh, cases are indeed very important. The gentleman down the back here has been waiting patiently. Uh, 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 ah. from okay, one over here and then... Hello, um, I am Petros, I, am, I come from KPMG. I would like to ask a question regarding um, uh, the compliance of uh, private companies uh, regarding uh, the legislation that is to be transposed. Uh, I understand that uh, there is at the moment uh, the ISO standard 37002 that is being under discussion regarding the protection of whistleblowers and I was wondering whether there is any alignment between this legislation and uh, and uh, the the standard that is being under discussion now, which is um, expected to be delivered in two years, exactly as the uh, the the, t the deadlines that is being put down uh, regarding the whistleblowers uh, uh, legislation of the EU being transposed to the national legislations. Thank you. Do we have anyone from the panel who uh, who has an answer to that one? Can I say that's a fantastic piece of analysis waiting to be done. I'm familiar with the standard, but I don't think there's been a close comparison critiquing the two side by side. So in your spare time. I think the gentleman over there has been... Uh, thanks everyone for the discussion. I think the, all the panel, the, they gave different perspective, which was very enlightening. I think it's very important, I mean, what uh, the representative of the Cyprus uh, Integrity Forum said about implementation. Because across the board there might be, the legislation might be the same, but the ability to implement the legislation can make a big difference. And uh, Mrs. Kabardi mentioned something very important, health and safety. So there are other issues. And normally the 90% is more difficult than the 100%. So what we do in everyday, in everyday life that might be wrong, we cannot really admit it. Whereas if, sorry, whereas if there is something that is really wrong, it's easy to acknowledge it and to report it. So there is a cultural aspect as well. 
But um, I will go, I will follow in different paths because legislation is there, anonymity is there, and, and I think everybody agrees. And also there are the channels through digital or Dropbox or whatever there is. This is already practices in place in more mature societies. I think the question is about accountability. What if we receive the information? What do we do about it? And uh, Mrs. Uh, Loisidou mentioned very clearly, is it malicious information? So what is, when the person will receive it, will, what question will make? What if is right, this person is right? Or will say, what if this person is not right and tries to serve? So it's very important also how we see things. And I think this can make a big difference. And my question is about accountability. What do we do about it? And how we can support any initiatives like the, the, the digital Dropbox or probably the legislation? How we make official or maybe institutions accountable to receive the information but to act upon it? And if they cannot act, will they take it a step further? Because this is really can make the difference. And the question is because from my experience from the Cyprus society, it's not about being anonymous because many people are willing to do it, but they feel that nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. So accountability is really is becoming an issue. Thank you. Anyone from the panel yeah. want to comment on it? I think the, the one who receives the information cannot decide whether it's uh, malicious or not. It's not his job. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, we remember this, um, this uh, criminal... Um, uh, no, the, the criminal situation we had with all these uh, ladies who disappeared because uh, the, uh, the recipient of the, of the, of the information um, decided that is not a serious allegation. We speak about the, the women who were murdered by this uh, insane. So the one who receives the information cannot decide. Otherwise, then we will have, um, we will have uh, in the same person the, the recipient, the judge, and the, and the executor. So, and um, your question, which uh, with, uh, I fully agree, uh, comes to, to a question to um, our friend from Spain. Is any, I mean, when we have this drop, uh, digital drop uh, situation, is, is it possible to have it in double? I mean, going to two different conflicting, conflicting uh, bodies. That means that one fears the other. So they cannot, uh, they cannot um, uh, hide the information or decide whether it's serious or not. Because at the same time they will know that somebody else who does not agree with them or who, who, who also have that information. Oh, yeah, has uh, the same information. So yeah. this, uh, uh, that will, I, I caught him, well, okay, I'm yeah. thinking loudly, but I think this kind of, um, of procedures will um, enhance the whole system. If you'd like to comment. Yes, um, technically it's possible to set up a, a Dropbox and having two different recipients of the information at the same time, even if they are like different or organizations. Um, but w what we also happens, uh, as a matter of fact, in Spain is that there are different organizations having the Dropboxes with similar or, or equivalent uh, level of protection. So you can go to the market regulator with uh, using one Dropbox and you send the information to them and you can also go to the anti-corruption office using a similar Dropbox with the same uh, anonymity level and, s and security channel to them. Uh, so you, as whistleblower, are able to provide that information to different com authority uh, competent authorities in order to let them investigate on that. Mm -hmm. so I think I think They should both know that yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Uh, I, I mean, the, that's the internal control mm -hmm. that would urge them to to take action and then investigate. Yeah, so yeah it's technical. Oh, yes, exactly. so from a technical level, knowing that yes, I submitted it here and there. 
Regulators. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is no system like that in Spain. It's technically like. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So I think one of the models that um, it has uh, actually has a notification scheme where the um, beneficiary, that is the recipient of the disclosure, uh, as the disclosure is made, the content isn't necessarily made to, for example, uh, an anti corruption NGO, but notification goes to them that a submission has been made. And then the clock is ticking because they they have the opportunity to call up and say, now, this has been a month. Have you actioned this? What steps have you taken? And maybe we don't know the specific elements of it, but we know that some submission was made. Uh, and that little is just a needle in the side to, to make that happen. So that's one of the um, final models. I think maybe one last question and then we'll... Uh, It's just a single competent authority that decides uh, whether, say, to, to license something. Mm -hmm. So why um, doesn't the directive provide for one competent authority to look into this and then set up the entire framework and go, obviously, to get support from other relevant uh, uh, departments from the government or other authorities? I'm surprised that there is not one competent authority mentioned. I'm not familiar, but maybe there is. Well, it's up to it's up to each member state to this. It's up to each member state to decide which competent authority this will be. The, the European Union cannot come and say you got to have an anti-corruption commissioner, or, but you have to appoint a particular department. So that's what the directive says. Okay, there is only a single competent authority. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that will make the task far easier when you have the criteria as well. But also the directive is saying that, say they report into your company that there is a, an internal whistleblower, then that information can also go to the independent commission against corruption. So then they can call you and say, what have you done about that? So that would be that oversight. That's what the directive is looking mm -hmm. at. Um, the gold standard that's often put out there is that there should be a standalone comprehensive whistleblower protection law and a national authority. You can get the needs met by regional authorities. So Spain does not have a national authority. Italy does have an anti-corruption national authority, but a number of the regional authorities do it very well uh, in Spain. So it, it can work, but the gold standard is really a national anti-corruption uh, authority. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, all right. <laughs> Since he can, <laughs> he's got the mic. He's Hi. not afraid to use uh, my it. My name is Andy DeBillis. I'm the correspondent in Athens for the National Herald in New York City. We cover Greece and Cyprus for the diaspora. I wanted to wait till the end because it seems what I'm hearing tonight reinforces the perception that not only is Cyprus not going to protect whistleblowers, but will continue to stifle whistleblowers. And I want to, as we say in the States, cut to the chase. What's the holdup? You can't lead from behind. Why isn't Cyprus taking the lead or doing something to reverse that perception, which is now reality amongst people in the diaspora? Why aren't whistleblowers being protected, one? Number two, why aren't they being rewarded for being whistleblowers so that you can overcome this stigma that's, you know, kind of a shroud over you? People think unfairly, uh, perhaps, and I'm not trying to be ironic, uh, how can you protect whistleblowers when you can't protect soccer referees? And people who are going to come forward to speak are going to have to worry about starting their cars. What's the holdup? Any panelists game to tackle that uh, question? Uh, there the were two draft laws of 2018 by the one by the Cyprus Security Exchange Commission and the other one by the Ministry and again another package consisting of three, three draft laws 
they were they are now uh, before the House of Representatives and uh, I don't know what the House of Representatives is expecting but uh, now the directive is a reality we have not the option but the obligation to transpose this legislation by December 2021 so we need to, uh, to, to, to take the provisions that, that are aligned with our culture, me mentality, and uh, uh, et cetera, and uh, just transpose it to national uh, legislation. I don't think that... Uh, um, uh? We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice, yeah. I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> With, uh, w sorry, with all sorts of people, hand in hand with academics, with lawyers, with the compliance industry, with business, with consumer affairs and protection organizations of all sorts. And that's because really whistleblower protection is not a left or right issue, it's a good governance issue. Um, and, and so that model of bringing in civil society proved extremely effective in the end in producing a directive that is is really pretty good um, and is kind of brave in places. Uh, and that hasn't always been the case for all legislation, obviously, in, in many countries. But if there is one thing I might uh, humbly suggest for Cyprus society to consider, because it has proven a successful model elsewhere, is to engage and bring in civil society into that process, because you will end up with a much uh, better outcome and one that is one made of consensus, um, not conflict. Um, did you want to make a uh, closing comments on behalf? Uh, or do you want to jump in just before? Yeah, just jump, just jump in and ask if you can please complete that questionnaire we've left on, yes. your, um, on your seat on whistleblowers. We're just trying to find out the, the views of whistleblowers um, so we can improve. Um, well, that's how us academics um, uh, do it. We just carry out research. <laughs> Thanks. So, so important to do that, to have that academic research really evidence-based. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Stelios Hadridophilus, would you like to make a closing comment on behalf of the Cyprus Integrity Forum? Yeah, thank you very much. It was an interesting discussion. What uh, I have to say that whistleblower protection legislation is needed. It could be the beginning to improve certain things in Cyprus. As it is mentioned before, the legislation uh, exist in European community and it's up to us to adjust it to our needs. As the anonymous whistleblower, the way I see it is the beginning of a process that we have to have certain triage process to identify whom we proceed to investigate and whom not. And as far as the name is concerned, because in, we heard a lot of about names in Greek that uh, People are uh, preoccupied with that. We can use as simple as that, whistleblowing. I am younger leader in Gipro. Whistleblowing, we can use the same way we're using fast food mm -hmm. and so on. Nobody's intimidated, doesn't mean anything, and everybody understands what we're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, uh, very much to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, Thank you, Marios, as well. If anyone would like to um, download, a Blueprint did a detailed critique of the directive when it was passed, uh, which outlines uh, an analysis of it against uh, best international standards with the lovely uh, you know, yellow, red, and uh, green uh, uh, evaluation of how it performs. It's, it's pretty strong overall, but it's available on our website and is a useful piece of analytic information if anyone needs it.
Thank you, Celeste. Thank, thank you, you, all the panelists. On behalf of, of Cyprus Integrity Forum, I would like to thank Blueprint for Free Speech for co-organizing the Today event. Special thanks to Cyprus Chamber of Commerce and Industry for their support and Vuli.tv for offering the live streaming of the event. Thank you all for being here with us today. Enjoy the refreshments. In thank, the you. Talk. thank you. Thank you so much. Please be good. Fantastic.